Uh, so today we are going to talk about the urinary system. It's very important for future doctors. Um, as independent on your specialization, you should understand how blood pressure is regulated in our organism, how drugs are excreted out of the organism, and many other aspects. Um, and those processes are controlled by kidneys. Um, so let's understand how they work. Um, I skip anatomy of the kidney, so about lobes, lobules, medulla, and cortex. I think you um i've already got some information from anatomy department but let's fix our attention at the aspect of its blood supply as kidneys are very unusual organs in terms of its um, blood um, vessel configuration so in kidneys um, we have a um, renal artery entering the organ then it splits into segmental arteries then interlobar arteries then arcuate arteries and after that, arcuate arteries, besides they are located on the border between the medulla and the cortex. Yeah. After that, from arcuate arteries, um, small interlobular arteries arise. Please do not confuse interlobular with interlobar. Yeah, much larger. So interlobular arteries, here they are shown in magnified diagram. So those interlobular arteries, they give rise to the afferent arterial. Then ball of capillaries with the fenestrated type, and then efferent arterial, and that's exactly where we can see the unusual feature of kidney blood supply. Here we can find blood capillaries put between the two arterials. So in blood capillaries, exchange of gases doesn't take place. So these capillaries are destined for another purpose and we'll discuss later for what purpose. So like uh, in our pituitary, for example, we had capillary plexus between two venules. Yeah, not to exchange cases. Here, um, opposite situation when uh, capillaries are put between the two arterials. After that efferent vessel, it dissipates into the peritubular capillary network. So secondary capillaries are formed. And uh, here, exactly exchange of cases uh, takes place. Um, after that, blood is collected by the interlobular veins, uh, and uh, then respective veins, uh, they um, transport the blood out of the organ. Okay, but uh, let's um, concentrate our attention on this element uh, and the processes um, occurring there. As you can see, the blood, of, uh, blood capillaries, uh, which are called uh, glomerulus, taken together those loops of capillaries, uh, they are called glomerulus or ball. Uh, they are surrounded by the so-called uh, Bowman's capsule. And uh, blood passing through those capillaries undergoes the process of filtration. So through those thin walls of capillaries, blood plasma is uh, percolates and enters this space of the Bowman's capsule. After that, the filtrate of the plasma which is called primary urine, moves along the system of tubules, collectively called the nephron. So here in the kidney, blood is filtrated, and this ultrafiltrate of the blood plasma is um, collected by nephrons. So nephron is the morphofunctional unit of kidney. There are many of them, and understanding the function of one unit will comprehend the function of the whole organ. Yeah, that's why we call them morphofunctional units. What elements uh, it includes? Um, first, nephron, it contains the capsule, collecting the filtrate, yeah, collecting the primary urine just after it is filtrated from the blood plasma. Then it contains the proximal portion, which is divided into convoluted and straight tubules. And after that thin portion, or the loop of Henle, which has thin descending and thin ascending limb. After that, the distal portion of the nephron, which is represented by distal straight and distal convoluted. And after that, connecting tubule, which connects nephron to the collecting duct. Please uh, do not forget that collecting duct itself is not included in the structure of the nephron. And uh, they derive from different sources, um, so we will discuss it a little bit later. And now, uh, during next several slides, uh, 
we will discuss the structure of every component of a nephron because they are very important and they perform very important functions. And let's start directly from the Bowman's capsule. So what happens there and how it is organized? Bowman's capsule is the double-walled cup. As you can see here, it has the parietal layer outermost made up of simple squamous epithelium and the visceral layer which is very closely embrace uh, blood capillaries we have just discussed. So, blood capillaries, where blood is filtrated, surrounded by the visceral layer, which is represented by special cells called podocytes. Podos means leg, like pseudopodia, pseudo false leg. Yeah. Uh, podocytes, these are the cells with many legs, they resemble octopi because they have many legs uh, and those soft legs, they embrace blood capillaries um, and uh, they represent the part of the filtration barrier we will discuss later. And the space between the visceral and parietal layer is called urinary space because exactly here, urine, primary urine is collected uh, just after the process of its filtration. So. Let's look in details uh, at this glomerulus. Uh, if we investigate the corrosion custom specimen, which is given here, we'll find out that the diameter of the afferent and efferent arterioles, uh, they differ one from another. And um, it creates uh, an increased blood pressure inside capillaries. Because usually the pressure there is much lower and blood passes slowly along the capillaries to allow exchange of gases. But here, as I've said, no extension of gases um, take place, but instead, uh, here, we can see the process of filtration. So, under very high pressure, the liquid portion of the blood percolates through the wall of those capillaries, creating the primary urine. So, glomerulus um, is a ball of capillaries, uh, which is represented by fenestrated uh, capillaries. Um, and they are surrounded by podocytes. And these are the cells of the visceral layer of the Bowman's capsule. Together, renal, I mean, together the blood capillaries with the Bowman's capsule, they represent the so called renal corpuscle or Malpighian corpuscle. As Malpighi he discovered the first microscope, and uh, after that, he discovered many structures and different organs. And, uh, so, renal corpuscle is here. And what process um, takes place in this renal corpuscle? The process of filtration. This is the primary process or primary step, the first step in the urine formation. So urine, uh, our urine is formed by plasma percolating through the wall of those capillaries. Um, and of course, um, as, uh, okay, let's um, go further. So filtration, means that there is a filter and uh, this filter is represented by three components they are very important so you have exactly know them you know there are many barriers in our organs um, in lungs in thymus uh, in testes so we'll investigate but in kidneys it is very important as this barrier borders the blood from urine and uh, we have to understand how this filter controls particles, which particles are allowed to pass to the urine, which are not. So, a filtration barrier is represented by three components. First of all, this is the wall of the blood capillaries. So, first, if any substance circulates in the blood, it should penetrate the wall of the capillary, which are of fenestrated type. And those fenestra inside capillaries, they up to 100 nanometers in diameter, so the size is very large. Particles uh, smaller than 100 nanometers, they can squeeze. So the next component is shown in blue color here. This is the basal lumina, so three-layered basement membrane. And uh, this basement membrane controls the diameter of particles um, much more strictly, so only particles smaller than 7 nanometers can pass across. And uh, after that, that's not the final element in the barrier. The final element, uh, these are the diaphragms between the podocytes legs. And 
as we can see, podocytes, um, they embrace blood capillaries almost completely, but there are still some slits uh, between their legs. Um, and those slits, they are tightened with diaphragms. Here, these diaphragms are shown. And inside those diaphragms, uh, there are pores with 4 to 7 nanometers uh, in diameter. And um, let's investigate each component of the barrier one by one. Because if, if barrier is broken, then blood appears in the urine. And hematuria it is called. Yeah, and uh, this is, of course, undesirable condition. And this is the sign of pathology. And um, to understand uh, the different abnormalities in the urine analysis, um, you have to understand um, how a normal process of filtration takes place. Okay, so <clears throat> besides, uh, except those three elements we have just discussed, two new elements were added and are considered now as the part of barrier. First of all, this is the endothelial surface area glycocalyx. Um, as you can see here, they have very rich glycocalyx network, which is negatively charged, um, so it um, also deters some particles from being filtrated. Um. And after that, subpodocyte space. Uh, this is the space between the capillary and podocyte bodies, and uh, it uh, occupies uh, more than 60% of the blood vessel surface area in the glomerulus. Uh, and, uh, the contact between the podocyte and the wall of capillary seems uh, uh, to be very important in process of filtration. Okay, so uh, let's um, investigate in details those three major components of the filtration barrier. First of all, we should say that the fenestrated endothelium um, is special in this place because it uh, almost has no diaphragms. You know, usually in fenestrated capillaries, uh, endothelial cells, they form holes, but those holes are covered with diaphragms. Here it seems they are absent, so the endothelium is very permeable. And we can see scanning electron micrograph with those holes, and uh, this is them, again, another, I think, freeze fracture method, showing us uh, blood capillaries from inside um, and podocytes from outside. So those holes, these are the fenestra in the endothelium. Next, uh, the basement membrane. So this is a very thick element uh, and uh, it's three layers are considered there. So the outermost and the innermost light elements and the middle dense. So lamina rara we call them and lamina densa. The outermost and innermost, they are the same in the structure, and they contain different elements, particularly heparin sulfate, which is negatively charged, and uh, as it is written, it impedes the passage of negatively charged molecules um, through the barrier. Then, lamina densa, the middle layer, is made up of a sieve-like structure and network of collagen type 4. This network that uh, has um, small diameter cells through which only particles smaller than nearly 4 nanometers can pass. And except type 4 collagen, also there are some in other types of collagen, perlican, argrin, and uh, also um, uh, such proteins as limonene, and they help uh, to fix podocytes to the base aluminum. So why we um, investigate all those components of the barrier in such a detail? So one might say that really we don't really need to know all those um, proteins and it is unnecessary information. Yeah. But um, first of all, mutations um, in those proteins, um, they cause different syndromes. So we have to be aware of um, and you'll investigate especially in pediatrics. So. And uh, also, let's um, look at the USMV MCQ example. I intentionally put it here for you to understand that if you want to know histology on the international level, if you want in future to uh, take the international level MCQs, if you want to work in the USA or anywhere in the Europe, you should deal with such a um, kind of MCQs. And so what's written there? Um, in the condition, a curl is given with a so-called protein rion. So the proteins uh, appear in her urine nearly 5 grams per day. 
Yeah, and podocyte uh, food processes, um, they are weak um, and um, um, not very well developed. Um, and uh, after that, the question is, uh, what um, element of the barrier is damaged um, and what causes proteinuria in this case? And uh, look at the variants of answers. Um, Prash border endothelial cell heparin sulfate integrin or type for collagen. So, you know that <clears throat> filtration barrier doesn't include brush buddha or integrin, so we exclude those two variants immediately. After that, we see that endothelial cells, they are uh, perforated with fenestra, and fenestra, they are very large in diameter, up to 100 nanometers, so they are not the key elements to decide uh, what size of particles will be filtrated. So it seems that endothelial cells uh, are not damaged in this case. But instead, as it is written, the podocytes are damaged um, and uh, some proteins appear in the urine. So what we have to suspect, um, actually heparin sulfate and type 4 collagen they are both included in the basement membrane. Let's return the previous slide. Here we know that in the lamina rara, heparin sulfate present in the lamina densa type for collagen. So both could be affected. But the question is, um, if girl has 5 grams of proteins in the urine, then what element is damaged? And the correct answer is heparin sulfate. Why? The answer is because if type for collagen is damaged, uh, then holes in the basal amino would be much larger and not only proteins would pass through those pores but also even erythrocytes so in case type 4 collagen is damaged not only proteins would appear in the urine but even red blood cells so not only protein urea but hematuria would be seen so to understand the difference and to choose the correct answer you should be aware about all components present in our filtration barrier and about all those proteins on the molecular level so do not ignore and prepare if you want to be really on the cutting edge so and the third component of the barrier these are the filtration slits between the podocytes legs and so if um, the endothelium is crossed on, if basement membrane is crossed on, then particles they deal with the slits between the podocytes legs. And here podocytes are shown and um, as you can see between their processes there are some slits covered with diaphragms. Those diaphragms, here you can see just a slit, but really it is not empty, it is tightened with the nephrine zipper-like structure and uh, the permeability of those slits um, depends uh, on the cytoskeleton of the podocyte. So if podocyte uh, tightens or straights uh, the diaphragm, then permeability increases. Yeah. If uh, instead it is relaxed, uh, then permeability decreases a little bit. So in this way, podocytes they can slightly regulate the permeability. And the activity of filtration. Okay, in this way we complete the block about the filtration barrier. I hope you've um, comprehended how important is it for your clinical thinking in future because um, uh, any damage in the filtration barrier of any component results in abnormalities with the urine and uh, to understand why some elements appear in the urine, you have to understand what elements are there in the filtration barrier and what is the exact function of every component. Um, so let's move on. And um, after we have uh, discussed the glomerulus and uh, the Bowman's capsule, we have to mention that there is one more cell population except podocytes um, between capillaries. Um, in um, the place where basement membrane between them is absent, there are some mesangial cells are located. Um, mesangial between vessels. Um, and those cells, um, they are interested, uh, they are very interesting because um, they are unusual. They derive from the mesoderm and uh, actually they derive from smooth muscle cells. Um, 
while they have some um, phagocytotic activity. So sometimes uh, they are considered as uh, macrophages, but really they derive not from the blood. Yeah. And um, uh, they produce some special biologically active substances, um, regulating the immune processes locally. And um, to some degree, they regulate the blood pressure. It was thought that mesangial cells, um, they can contract uh, glomeruli capillaries, increasing the blood pressure, increasing the filtration rate in this way. But um, later on, it was revealed that that's not true. And they have minimal effect uh, on the filtration and uh, on the blood pressure regulation. So I think it even shouldn't be mentioned among their functions. Uh, so why besides uh, we mentioned those mesangial cells? Uh, because there is a wide group of diseases uh, in nephrology. They are called glomerulonephritis. Um, and uh, there are different types of glomerulonephritis. Some of them are caused by proliferation of the cells of parietal wall of the Bowman's capsule. Some of them due to podocytes um, proliferation, some of them due to mesangial cell proliferation, some of them due to neutrophils arrival to the glomerulus. And to understand all those subtypes and to understand the classification of those diseases, uh, you should be aware about every cellular subtype present uh, in, um, in the kidney glomerulus. Okay, let's move on. And after we have discussed the primary site of urine formation, uh, Bowman's capsule, where filtration takes place. Uh, after that, we uh, continue with all the other elements of the nephron. So then urine enters the proximal convoluted and straight tubules, uh, and let's discuss them. So the proximal thick segment convoluted and straight, um, it resembles the duodenum in its structure because as the duodenum receives the food um, the chime from stomach yeah and uh, actively absorbs all the nutrients uh, in the same way here yeah, proximal convoluted tubules they receive urine just from the woman's capsule primary urine is rich in nutrients um, so lots of substances should be reabsorbed back to the blood and here I'm sorry, the process of reabsorption takes place. So why it is not absorption but reabsorption? Because just after the filtration, some molecules, they appear in the primary urine, but as those molecules are considered as useful, they, return, they are returned back to the blood. So reabsorption, they return to the blood. Being filtrated, after that, they are returned to the blood. Uh, so, reabsorption of nutrients um, is an important process because in the filtration process we control only the size of the particles or maybe they are charged, but we do not control their usefulness. That's why all small particles, including amino acids, glucose molecules, um, some ions, uh, um, they enter the primary urine. Of course, we should not lose because nearly 180 liters of primary urine is formed per day. Of course, we do not urinate. We do not lose 180 liters every day. Otherwise, we should drink continuously yeah, and eat. Uh, so we cannot afford uh, ourselves to lose so many nutrients with our urine. So reabsorption takes place. Um, and uh, exactly in the proximal convoluted tubules, um, uh, the reabsorption of nearly 120 liters takes place. Of. And uh, different transport systems uh, work here. For example, the glucose um, is uh, transported together with the sodium, then water is transported with the aquaparine channels, um, and uh, small peptides, they undergo pinocytosis. That's why close to the apical membrane some pinocytotic vesicles could be seen. Uh, what about the ultrastructure, the morphology of uh, the proximal tubules? Um, they have uh, microvilli on their top. That's why I told you they resemble small intestine. Because microvilli, they increase the surface area of absorption. Besides, they also produce some peptides and participate in, in digestion of uh, peptides and amino acids in the same way. So, also those cells, they expose a lot of mitochondria as the reabsorption is active process. It needs energy. And... Um, if we look at the 
basal side of the cell will find out there lots of enfoldings of the plasma membrane and between those enfoldings mitochondria um, interspersed. So that's what we call the basal striations. So in the proximal convoluted tubules, cells, they expose the brush border made up of microvilli and basal striations, both destined to increase the surface area, the surface area of reabsorption uh, and the ion transport. And um, mitochondria, they give energy for this process. Besides, uh, do not forget that here exactly hydroxylation, final hydroxylation of um, the vitamin D3 takes place. Um, you remember that protein, uh, vitamin was formed in the skin. Last lecture we discussed it was formed under the ultraviolet radiation in keratinocytes uh, of our skin. After that in the liver, in the copper cells, it undergoes the hydroxylation and additional hydroxylation takes place exactly here in the proximal convoluted tubules. Um, so, by moving along the proximal convoluted tubules, then proximal straight tubule is located. It has almost the same structure with less microvilli, less um, mitochondria inside. And eventually it enters a so-called loop of Henle or thin part of the nephron, thin descending and thin ascending limb. They are called descending and ascending because of the direction of um, the urine movement. What is important that, uh, to highlight that in the loop of Henle, descending portion reabsorbs water, ascending portion reabsorbs sodium and chloride ions. And these are the basics uh, of the countercurrent multiplier mechanism you'll discuss in physiology department. Now we have to say that in the ascending limb, where sodium and chloride are transported to the interstitium, we can see the water reabsorption, but instead interstitium becomes hyper smaller due to high ion concentration. And as uh, the descending limb is surrounded by the hyperosmotic environment, then water is reabsorbed passively due to osmotic gradient, due to osmotic pressure. So it is very important to understand that the reabsorption of water and sodium chloride are independent, but they are connected. Okay, uh, so here we can see the minimal energy expenditure and uh, at the same time um, uh, the very effective process of obligatory reabsorption. Why we call the obligatory reabsorption of water obligatory in this place? Because in any way, this water is reabsorbed. It, uh, this process uh, is not affected by hormones or any other circumstances. That's why what is the clinical, besides significance uh, of this um, information, uh, besides yeah, what we have to add, that uh, by passing through the loop of Henle, if at the beginning, um, the filtrate is either osmotic, means uh, the normal osmotic pressure is in the blood plasma. Then uh, when it exits the ascending limb here, the content is uh, hyperosmotic. Because as it is uh, written, salts are reabsorbed more intensely than water. So to normalize the osmolarity, Next segments of nephrons uh, of nephron are used, and we will discuss it later. But what clinical significance it has? As we know that in the loop of Henle, lots of water is reabsorbed. So, if we want to force diuresis in the patient, we prescribe loop diuretics, and we choose exactly loop diuretics in case of acute edema when patients, they have lots of fluid in the interstitial space. We want this fluid to be excreted through kidneys. Yeah. And uh, we use a special drugs to block sodium chloride reabsorption in the ascending limb. And in this way, patients, uh, they lose water and it helps them to deal with edema, for example. Okay, let's move on. And uh, let's talk about the distal thick segment. So it 
receive some hypertonic um, uh, primary urine and uh, almost all nutrients are already reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubules. Um, so what happens here? Here reabsorption of sodium chloride and water is uh, continued and also some elements are added intentionally to the urine, something like ammonium or the hydrogen ions um, to regulate the acidity, to regulate the pH level. And also, as it is written, the reabsorption of calcium is under the control of the parathyroid hormone. And uh, also in this um, distal segment, some elements could be intentionally secreted to the urine. If uh, some elements can't be filtrated inside the glomerulus due to some different reasons. Um, so some elements could be secreted. And uh, if we are talking about the process of urine formation, we usually mention three steps of urine formation. These are filtration, then reabsorption, and secretion. So urine is filtrated, some elements, uh, useful elements, are retained and retained in the organism, and some waste uh, uh, present even in the small amount, um, they are intentionally produced um, or secreted to the urine. So in the distal thick, uh, thick segment, uh, the process of reabsorption continues, but less actively. So it uh, almost lacks microvilli, but mitochondria with basal stations um, are still present. We should say that also uh, those cells are a little bit more basophilic, comparing with the proximal segment, and it helps us to distinguish them. The presence of brush border is the first criterion, present in the proximal, absent in the distal. The second criterion, acidophilic and basophilic septoplasm. So, uh, next. Uh, after we have discussed all elements of the nephron, we should also uh, fix our attention on the collecting duct system. Collecting ducts, um, they are also because they collect uh, urine from different nephrons um, and they contain um, simple cuboidal epithelium and cells of two types. Um, first, principal or light cells. Um, as it is written here, they perform important function in water reabsorption. And here, water reabsorption is under the control of different hormones, um, aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone, which is also called vasopressin. Aldosterone we investigated in the peripheral endocrine system, because it is produced by the adrenal cortex, it's zona glomerulosa, you remember. And antidiuretic hormone is produced by hypothalamus. So they affect the yeah. sodium and water reabsorption in two different ways. For example, aldosterone, it stimulates sodium reabsorption and water usually follows the sodium due to osmolarity. While antidiuretic hormone, it incorporates aquaparin channels uh, inside the collecting duct cells. So, containing or bearing more aquaparin channels, uh, light cells become more permeable for water. So, it is reabsorbed uh, more effectively. And uh, in this way, both hormones, in different way, but they stimulate water reabsorption. And we call this uh, facultative reabsorption because uh, it is not obligatory, like in the loop of Henle, but it might be regulated. Them. Uh, it was thought that aldosterone also affects water reabsorption in the distal convoluted tubules, uh, but uh, nowadays uh, it is uh, debated. Um, some scientists, uh, they believe that aldosterone target is only collecting duct light cells, uh, but not the uh, distal convoluted tubules. Um, Okay, then what about intercalated cells? In the collecting duct, we have one more population of cells resembling parietal cells of our stomach. You remember parietal cells, they produced hydrogen ions with the help of um, uh, carboni uh, carbonic anhydrase. The same is the function for intercalated cells. Alpha type of cells produce hydrogen, while beta type produced by carbonate. Both are used to balance the pH level inside collecting ducts. It's very important because if pH is imbalanced, then some precipitations uh, might occur, causing stones um, 
the formation. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, what is another subject of controversies? This is the erythropoietin production. You know that kidneys they produce erythropoietin, and it stimulates erythropoiesis. But the question is, which cells produce it? Um, according to the recently published data, uh, the site of erythropoietin production under normal circumstances is a collecting duct and exactly the intercalated cells. But some other scientists, um, they reveal their messenger RNA of erythropoietin in the interstitial cells of kidneys. So I think both is true usually. And uh, uh, just at least remember that kidneys are, are the sites of erythropoietin synthesis. So due to chronic uh, kidney inflammation or diseases, uh, patients suffer from decreased hemoglobin. So it should be controlled and taking into account the role of kidneys uh, in erythropoiesism. Okay, uh, then uh, as for the aldosterone, I want to fix your attention that uh, it is produced uh, due to either decreased blood volume, just after the blood loss, or due to the increased potassium concentration. Actually, this is the part of physiology, but I think it is important to understand the physiology, the histology of the kidney. So, depending on the reason of aldosterone production, aldosterone has different effects. So, it is called the aldosterone paradoxon. Okay, let's move on, because lots of things uh, are to discuss today. And after we have discussed the structure of the nephron, the function of all its compartments, after we now comprehend that uh, woman's capsule uh, collects the urine just after it is uh, filtrated from the blood, then proximal convoluted tubules reabsorb almost everything, among the nutrients, back to the blood. Then a loop of Henle reabsorbs water and sodium chloride. And and then distal convoluted tubule continues the process of reabsorption and at last in the collecting duct again water is reabsorbed now let's look on two different types of nephrons and understand what's the difference uh, they differ by their location that's why they are called cortical close to the cortex and juxta medullary juxta means close around so juxta medullary a little bit closer to the medulla. Uh, but not only location differs. Um, as you can see that uh, in the loop of Henle difference is that in the juxtamedullary nephrons, uh, loop of Henle is much longer and it penetrates deep into the medulla. While in the cortical nephrons, uh, loop of Henle is very short and sometimes ascending limb is represented by the thick segment of the distal tubule, distal straight tubule. So this thin segment is very short, while in the juxtamedullary it's very long. Yeah. The difference is also in the diameter of the afferent and efferent arterial. If in juxtamedullary nephrons, efferent uh, arterial is smaller, so here extremely high pressure is present. Then in the cortical nephrons, they are almost equal in diameter, so filtration is much slower, much less effective here. So the concentration of urine is uh, more prominent in juxtamedullary nephrons. Notice they account nearly 15% uh, of the total number of nephrons in our kidneys. So why is it important to understand? Because um, uh, these nephrons are the first to be affected by hypertension because they are located more close to the arcuate artery, so the pressure is increased. Moreover, they have afferent arterial larger than the efferent, so this is the second reason of increased pressure. Yeah, the pressure is increased to filtrate the blood. This is the normal situation, but if systemic blood pressure is increased, um, then of course um, they could undergo some pathological changes. Uh, notice also that in the cortical nephrons, peritubular capillary network is present, while in the juxtamedullary, blood capillaries, they trace, they follow uh, the loop of Henle. And uh, the essence uh, and the reason of doing that is that by descending to the medulla in these blood capillaries, uh, uh, they lose water 
because I remind you that here hyper a smaller um, uh, how to say matrix um, uh, is um, present. So by returning back to the cortex, so by returning back um, those blood capillaries, they gain back water from the interstitium because the osmolarity increases uh, from cortex to the medulla. So by blood, by uh, movement uh, from the cortex to the medulla, it loses water and then it receives water back. So the process is in equilibrium and uh, that's why blood vessels are located in this way. Okay, let's move on. And here, once again, um, the difference is shown between the juxtamedullary um, nephrons um, and cortical nephrons. Um, juxtamedullary are located close to the arcuate artery and uh, the pressure is increased um, there. Okay, and now let's move, to the, uh, move on and discuss the most important aspect uh, of this lecture. This is the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Juxta means around, glomerulus means ball of capillaries. So this apparatus is located close to capillaries of the kidney. And it includes three types of cells. These are the macula denser cells. Uh, as you can see, these cells are the part of the distal convoluted tubule. Then juxtaglomerular cells, the same as the apparatus. These are the smooth muscle cells in the afferent arterial. And these are the juxtavascular cells put in the triangular space between the macula densa and two arterioles. Uh, and here the information is represented in the written form. So juxtaglomerular cells, um, they produce some um, renin and they stimulate blood pressure to be increased. And that's what we are going to discuss during the next slide. Then macula densa cells. Um, they um, are the part of the distal convoluted tubule and um, their function is to regulate renin production in response to changes of sodium ion concentration in the urine. So here in the distal convoluted tubules, um, primary urine is located and depending on sodium concentration there, Macula densa regulates the activity of juxtaglomerular cells, whether to produce or not to produce renin. So the sodium concentration in the urine affects the juxtaglomerular cells and their renin production. And the third uh, population, these are the extraglomerular mesangial cells. Their function is not yet fully um, comprehended, so just mention them. You should. Uh, know where they are located, but as for their function, um, just let's skip it. And let's discuss the function of the renin and the function of the juxtaglomerular cells. How they regulate the blood pressure. Let's imagine that the blood pressure decreases and in the afferent arterial the blood pressure is low, so renin is injected into the bloodstream. Renin is not a hormone, but this is an enzyme. Please fix it in your mind. So renin catalyzes the reaction of angiotensinogen conversion into ang angiotensin 1. So in our blood, angiotensinogen circulates. It is produced by the liver and it circulates in the blood. Once renin is injected, it converts this angiotensinogen inactive substance into angiotensin 1. Then this angiotensin 1 through the blood enters the lungs and here the very pivotal event takes place. This angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2 with the help of the angiotensin converting enzyme. Why it is so important? Because uh, in the whole world, uh, the drugs blocking this enzyme are widely used to decrease the blood pressure. And uh, for your future clinical thinking, it's very important to understand the process of all the, the chains, um, the components uh, of this chain. 
so after angiotensin II is produced, um, it affects adrenal gland and stimulates it to produce aldosterone. Then aldosterone, it goes to kidneys, it affects its distal and collecting ducts, distal convoluted tubules, and also it affects collecting ducts, um, light cells, um, stimulating them I'm sorry, to reabsorb more water, more sodium and water, respectively. If sodium and water is reabsorbed, then uh, more water retains in the organism, more water circulates in the bloodstream, and as a result, the blood pressure increases. Obviously, yes, if more blood is there inside the vessel, so the vessels will uh, extend it, because uh, that's why the pressure is high. So, being produced by kidneys, eventually renin results in, in the water reabsorption by the same organ. And uh, here the simple chain of events is given. Uh, so, renin is used only as a catalyst, um, like uh, the enzyme, helping to break down angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. Then angiotensin converting enzyme, which is present in our lungs or VLA, helps uh, to create angiotensin 2. And it has the direct effect on vessels wall. It has vasoconstriction effect. And also it causes aldosterone production. Aldosterone stimulates reabsorption of water and uh, sodium. And in this way increases the blood volume and blood pressure respectively. So, uh, what... Uh, is the clinical significance, the in enormous clinical significance, because now you know that uh, uh, blood pressure regulation could be realized in blocking angiotensin converting enzymes, so this substance could be blocked, or receptors of angiotensin 2. If this substance is inactivated, then blood pressure doesn't increase. So these are the two most widely used drugs in pharmacology of hypertension blockers of uh, angiotensin converting enzyme or angiotensin receptors. Why nowadays this problem became especially popular? Because uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2, as we have said uh, in the topic respiratory system, is used as the entry point for coronavirus. So cells exposing this enzyme they are especially sensitive for coronavirus. So, uh, notice that angiotensin converting enzyme 2 has opposite effects to angiotensin converting enzyme 1 and it lowers the blood pressure. So, it acts to counterbalance the effect of the ACE1. And uh, so, they work together and uh, the proper balance should be between them. But what is especially interesting is that uh, people taking drugs blocking ACE1 to blocking angiotensin receptors. In such patients, if they take these drugs, the concentration of receptors increases, so they become more sensitive for coronavirus. Okay, uh, this is like the the set of compensatory reactions. So, if people use angiotensin converting enzyme blockers, by compensation, their organism starts to produce more ACE. More ACE is produced, more sensitive organism is for coronavirus. Okay. So, uh, ACE blockers, as well as angiotensin blockers, uh, they increase the expression of uh, ACE1 as well as ACE2. And uh, if you are interested in details, uh, I'll put the hyperlink in the description for the article explaining the nature of this phenomenon. Okay, and uh, another example from USMLE database. Um, why should you investigate all this process? Um, is what is given here that the patient um, has gastrointestinal bleeding, so blood loss um, is implied. Um, and the pulse rate is very high, like in compensation. And the question is, um, what is the reason? No, what would happen? How blood pressure will be increased? Um, and the correct answer is the increased renin secretion. Of course, as 
Iranian launches the chain of reactions resulting in the elevation of the blood pressure, then renin should be increased. But notice that another answer, like increased antidiuretic hormone production, is also correct because due to the blood loss, not only aldosterone will be produced, but antidiuretic hormone as well. Yeah, but the question is which of the following is the most important expected physiologic response to the patient's current condition and the most important response to the blood loss is the secretion of renin so renin is more important than antidiuretic hormone okay take into account and be very attentive answering your similar questions okay uh, so here the summary of the angiotensin uh, renin angiotensin uh, aldosterone system is given. Once again, uh, it is shown that liver produces angiotensin gene, then it is uh, converted into angiotensin 1 under the action of the renin. Then here we can see the ACE uh, enzyme converting angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. And uh, as you can see here, ACE inhibitors are the most widely used drugs. And then also, angiotensin receptor blockers are the second group of specimens. So, both stimulate increase in ACE production and uh, increase the sensitivity for coronavirus. Then, uh, adrenal gland stimulates aldosterone. Aldosterone affects uh, the kidney, stimulate and reabsorption of um, sodium and water. So, to understand how to regulate blood pressure, and this is a widely spread problem and it is very common in people after the 15 and even earlier you have to understand how the system works as you can affect different components besides you also can prescribe diuretics uh, and uh, if patient has elevated blood pressure diuretics uh, they help to lose water and in this way to decrease the blood pressure okay let's move on and also i should mention that except aldosterone um, renin aldosterone i'm sorry renin angiotensin aldosterone system we have another one uh, destined to counterbalance its effects so calicrine kinin system is used uh, to decrease the blood pressure by production of um, nitric monoxide and uh, prostaglandin and i'm not sure um, it is very important and um, but in any way you have to be aware about the system okay and uh, after we have discussed the kidney we should also say several words about the urinary ureters um, in urinary bladder urethra uh, and uh, those organs um, they conduct um, the urine and um, eventually it uh, they excrete it out of the organism and uh, their general plan of their structure is that they are lined with urethelium. This is the special type of epithelium transitional. It is also called epithelium. And uh, it has a special feature. Its structure depends on the stretching degree. So more stretched epithelium is more thin, more flattened cells are in the superficial layer. So superficial cells, they change their shape. Um, then as uh, you can see mm, the cells of the superficial layer they are not uh, only changing their shape but also they have some another features for example uh, you may see that on the surface uh, there are lots of those concave um, structures um, and uh, they are present in form of patches um, and uh, those fragments of the apical surface membrane they are called asymmetric unit membranes um, asymmetry because the outer phospholipid layer is more thick than the inner and there is special protein called uroplakin is present this protein helps to regulate the permeability of the cells you know that there are tight junctions between them preventing leakage of urine and moreover cells are impermeable for urine and water because of the uroplakin present and um, when organ is relaxed, those membrane units, uh, they become incorporated uh, into the cytoplasm and they form so-called fusiform vesicles. Here they are, fusiform vesicles. 
once organ is stretched, those fusiform vesicles, they become incorporated into the apical membrane, increasing its surface area. That's why the urethelium is really stretchable. It really increases in surface when it is stretched um, due to those um, shuttling mechanism. So fusiform granules, uh, they fuse the exocytos and they fuse with the membrane once organ is stretched and they return back to the cytoplasm and organ is relaxed. Um, so uh, there are except superficial cells. Uh, also we have intermediate cell layers um, and uh, eventually they replace the uppermost uh, cells um, with the time. And basal layer, it contains the stem cells for the urethelium. So this is for the urethelium, it's unusual epithelium. And uh, it lines um, particularly ureter. Ureters uh, and uh, in ureters uh, as well as in other compartments um, of the urinary system, like in the urinary bladder, uh, we should say that um, in the mm, mucosa, uh, muscularis mucosa is absent, so there is no border between the mucosa and submucosa. Uh, but infoldings of mucosa are present, so one might think that there is the muscularis mucosa, but there is no. Uh, then, um, a muscularis is represented usually by two layers of smooth muscle cells and they are arranged um, in another way comparing with the digestive system. Here, the longitudinal layer is the innermost, circular layer is the outermost. Um, and in the lower part of ureters, uh, also the third outer longitudinal layer is uh, also could be present. Um, and um, what else? Uh, in the urinary bladder, I think uh, the structure, the general plan of the structure is the same uh, smooth muscles, uh, they are not separated into layers, uh, they form so-called detrusor muscle. And uh, okay, the same urethelium is present, um, so uh, we have also to mention urethra uh, at the end of the lecture. Urethra, it is it differs between males and females. In males, uh, urethra is represented by the, those um, three parts given, and uh, they are shown in the picture. Uh, so prostatic, membranous, uh, and um, the panel of spongy urethra. And they are lined with different types of epithelium, while in the prostate it is lined with the transitional epithelium, uh, then the pseudostratified columnar epithelium, and at last um, it shifts uh, to the uh, skin-like uh, epithelium, stratified squamous keratinized and um, non-keratinized. Um, yeah, so I think uh, we have considered kidneys um, and other organs of uh, our urinary system. In details, you'll read the textbook. I think uh, there is nothing to explain. It's very easy. You can... Uh, study from the basic information, but what should we discuss at the end is the embryonic development of the urinary system, because it is extremely complicated. And um, the first uh, generation of kidneys um, appears uh, in the cephalic region of our um, of the embryo, and uh, actually those um, excretory dots, uh, they degenerate till the end of the fourth week. So we have to say that kidneys uh, in embryonic development they are generated in three waves uh, as in evolutionary development the most primitive kidney appears in the intermediate mesoderm of the most cranial regions of the embryo and it corresponds uh, to the primitive animals uh, and it degenerates in humans then the mesonephros here the more developed kidney appears a little bit later it uh, has in every segment a, a pair of excretory tubules like nephron like structures yeah and uh, those excretory tubules they fuse and they discharge their content to the mesonephric or wolfian duct here it is formed by the intermediate mesoderm. And uh, eventually mesonephrus in females degenerates, but in males it uh, participates in the formation of some uh, seminiferous ducts um, 
and we'll discuss next lecture what exactly they do for males. So the mesonephros, the second generation of kidney, uh, it is transformed into male reproductive system, but it doesn't participate in the excretion of urine. It excretes spermatozoa. Okay, and eventually the most developed, um, the most um, noble kidney is formed um, at the base of the mesonephric duct, and this kind of kidney is called metanephros or definitive kidney. So metanephros is formed by two parts, and it's very important now. The first part, this is the mesonephric bud. So this mesonephros at the beginning of its formation gives rise to the uh, so-called um, ureteric bud. Ureteric bud arises from the mesonephros and gives rise to the ureter, gives rise to the ma major minor calyces and uh, also to the collecting duct system. So those yellow pot collecting ducts, they made up of ureteric bud and they derive from the mesoderm, from the intermediate mesoderm. But also there is another source shown in blue color, which is called metanephric blastema. It is not segmented and it um, is organized um, around the ureteric bud and gives rise to all the other parts of the nephron except the collecting duct. That's why we say that nephron does not include <clears throat> the collecting duct because it arises from quite another source and um, many nephrons uh, fuse with one collecting duct because you know, besides you know that one collecting duct with all the nephrons associated with it is called the kidney globule.